Right, great, thanks. thanks. So thanks very much to the uh, organizers uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to present this work. Um, this is stuff I've been doing in my postdoc with uh, Pierre. Um, so Pierre has been um, working a lot on unbiased estimation for Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, today, I'm going to assume that most of you guys have not seen one of his talks recently. And so I'm going to try to give a broad overview of some of these ideas. And then we'll focus on um, the specific coupling we came up with for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. <clears throat> so um, here's the plan of my talk. I'm going to start by just setting up the problem, um, discussing MCMC, its burn-in bias, and why that hinders uh, parallel computation. With that as motivation, um, I will then introduce our proposed methodology, which would remove the burn-in bias and hence enable parallel computation. Um, this uh, proposed methodology very much depends on your, your ability to come up with couplings of MCMC algorithms. So that's going to be the second half of the talk. So the setting is quite uh, typical. So let's assume that we have a target distribution, I'll denote as pi. Uh, this has a density, I'll write as pi of x, with respect to Lebesgue measure on Rd. Uh, the objective here is to compute um, expectations of some test function h uh, respect to pi. So h will be something that will be fixed throughout the talk. Um, and so I'll assume that obviously this integral is not tractable and d is large, so you would have to resort to um, Monte Carlo methods, uh, the simplest of which would be to sample, say, iid from pi, in which case you will return this simple sample average, which you know is a consistent estimator as you send the number of samples capital T to infinity by the law of large numbers, right? So obviously in practice, uh, for most problems of practical interest, you wouldn't be able to sample directly from the target distribution pi. Uh, but what you could do is you could simulate a Markov chain that converges to pi as its stationary distribution. So this is really the basis of all MCMC algorithms. And roughly speaking, you can think of each MCMC algorithm as defining a pi invariant Markov kernel which I'll denote by k. So the algorithm is quite simple. You initialize the Markov chain x0 um, from an initial distribution, which I'll denote as pi0. I will assume that this is not pi, so we're not doing perfect simulation. And, pi, and that pi0 might be possibly quite far away. We then iterate by simulating the next state of the Markov chain xt, given the current state of the Markov chain xt minus 1 uh, by sampling from the Markov kernel k. And then you iterate for as long as you can, right, to get capital T samples. Uh, we then return this estimator here, which is given by the sample average, uh, with possibly some burn-in, uh, I'll denote by B. And under very mild assumptions on the, uh, the algorithm itself, um, you can guarantee that using the ergodic theorem that this will be a consistent estimator as you, as you send, again, the, num the number of samples to infinity. So here's... Um, a realization of an MCMC trajectory. Um, here I'm targeting a standard normal distribution with an initial distribution that is, uh, as you can see, quite far away from the origin with quite a diffuse uh, variance. The algorithm that defines my uh, Markov kernel K here is uh, random walk Metropolis Hastings, and I've selected some, uh, some uh, proposal standard deviation. So here's the plot when you repeat this uh, several times. Um, and for, if for each time, time slice, uh, if, you did, if, you, if you collected all your samples, did a kernel density estimate, and you put all of those kernel density estimates together, you get this uh, joy plot here. Okay? So from this plot, you can kind of eyeball this and say, well, after 100 iterations, I'm somewhat close to the stationary distribution. So maybe 100 might be a reasonable burn-in value, right? What's important to, to note here is that if you look at the bias of the estimator, so this is the expectation of my estimator, uh, less what you're trying to estimate, this thing is um, non-zero for any fixed B, uh, for B for burn-in, and the, the number of samples, capital T. So, Obviously, from the previous slide, you might think that, well, in some cases, you know, this B might be sufficient, and hence this bias might, might be very small, but this is something you typically would not know, right? 
What we do know, however, is that if you fix B and send the number of samples to infinity, right, then the bias goes to zero. So the implications of these two very small remarks are that if you were to do what I'll call naive parallelization, so if you were to simulate um, capital R chains, and then if you were to compute um, the average uh, across those R chains and return that as an estimator, this estimator would be not consistent as you send the number of uh, processes R to infinity and if you fix B and T, right? What you do know, uh, based on the second remark, is just that you know, this estimator would be consistent as you send the number of samples to infinity. This is not quite what you want, obviously, if, you are, if you have access to a parallel compute environment with a large number of cores, you really want this R going to infinity limit, is kind of what we are arguing today. So here's um, a very high-level slide to describe our proposed uh, methodology. Um, this is something good to keep in mind because I'll return back to this slide every time I want to describe each uh, bullet point in more detail. Okay? Um, so it, what we're proposing here is to run um, two coupled chains, I'll denote by X and Y, uh, for each processor. So each processor here is depicted as a gray block. Right? So we have chain X, uh, say, on top and Y below. These chains are coupled so that after some random number of iterations, uh, they meet exactly. And I'll be a bit more precise what I mean by meeting uh, in the next few slides. We don't stop um, when the chains meet, however. You kind of stop at some random time, which would depend on the meeting time. And again, I'll be more precise uh, what I mean here. Each processor then returns um, an unbiased estimator, um, which I'm denoting by H um, subscript K colon M. So K and M here are going to be two tuning parameters uh, of our algorithm, which I will discuss uh, how, you would, uh, how you would pick some of these things. And based on the unbiasedness property, what I can do now is I can safely average over the estimators produced by each of these R processes to get an estimator that is consistent as I send the number of processes to infinity, right? just by the law of large numbers. Also, using central limit theorem for IID random variables, uh, we can construct things like confidence intervals for our estimator. Okay? Um, so that's all nice and good. What's good to also keep in mind is that the efficiency of our methodology uh, very much depends on two things. It depends on the expected compute cost. So this has to do with the meeting time and how well you can couple chains in high dimensions um, and the variance, of course, uh, of our estimator. Okay? So I'm going to start by describing um, how you will come up with unbiased estimators. Uh, so this is really a debiasing idea that comes from this paper by Glynn and Rhee um, some years ago now. So let me start by noting that um, uh, ergodicity of the Markov chain gives us convergence of expectations right, to what we want as you send the number of samples to infinity. So now what I can do is I can rewrite this limit on the left-hand side um, as a telescopic sum here, um, starting at some value k, which I can fix, right? So that's, uh, that's my tuning parameter. And here I have the difference uh, of the successive differences, sum to infinity. Now, assuming that it's valid to interchange the order of summation and expectation, so this needs a lot of justification, um, which is why this slide is only kind of a heuristic, then I have this equality, okay? So I've not done anything particularly smart here. And if you were to think about computing what's inside the expectation as an unbiased estimator, um, this is tricky, right? Because, because I still have an infinite sum here. Now, if I assume that I can construct another Markov chain I'll denote as Y, which is such that X and Y, um, they have the same law in the sense that they have the same marginal distributions for all times, then what I could do is I could um, replace x t minus 1 here with y t minus 1, right, under the expectation. And if I were to assume that these chains, so the x and the y chains, they meet uh, with a lag of 1. So this is a bit annoying uh, in the notation, but uh, we have to accept this lag. If they meet at some random time tall, and if they stay together after they've met, okay, so this is what this, uh, this constraint says, 
then I can truncate this uh, infinite sum uh, to tau t minus uh, to tau minus one, right? So this prompts the following definition of an estimator, uh, denoted as a, uh, capital H subscript k, and so basically what you see on the right hand side here is uh, whatever lies in the expectation at the end of the slide. Okay, so if you look at this a little bit more carefully, uh, under some conditions, which I'll list uh, in a minute, one can prove that this is in fact an unbiased estimator of the expectation of interest with finite variance and finite expected cost. Okay, so here are the conditions. Um, number one, we assume that the expectations converge to the expectations of interest, so the, this we've seen. Okay. We need a little bit more, so this basically says I need uh, bounded two plus delta moments. This is a bit technical, but it's not so, not so um, restrictive. And now if I, if I define the meeting time more formally, so, so tall here is defined as the first time the x and the y chains meet with this one lag that I mentioned before. Um, condition two here re requires that this meeting time has geometric tails, okay, so of this particular form. Um, and last but not least, um, we need these chains to be faithful. So this says that once they meet at this random time tall, they stay together for the rest of time. So I'm going to follow uh, Jeff Rosenthal's terminology here and call this faithfulness. So here's another look at our estimator, um, which we know is unbiased for any value of k. So let's first build some intuition. So firstly, if if you just look at the first term here, this is obviously in general a bias term, right? Because at step k, the Markov chain might not have reached stationarity, right? So you can think of uh, the second term here as a, as a sort of bias correction, okay? Which you know would be zero. Um, so I forgot to mention, I'm using the convention here that if uh, k plus one is less than, uh, tau, is, is greater than tau minus one, then you treat this, uh, this term as being zero, okay? So if k is large enough, uh, then, then uh, the second bias correction term is just zero. Okay. So now if I increase k, what you see is that because of uh, the assumptions I made on the tails of the meeting time, um, my estimator would start becoming just the first term hxk with increasing probability, right? which means that as k increases, we can expect the variance of our estimator to converge to the variance of um, of h under the target distribution pi, right? So roughly speaking, this says that my, my variance will be reduced as I increase k. Um, of course, this comes, at, this comes with more compute costs, right? Because the cost of computing k um, roughly has this form in units of uh, k, of applying the, mar the marginal kernel k. Uh, and you can see that k features here. So, so you can reduce the variance if you increase k but it comes at the expense of a uh, higher cost here. Uh, let me now introduce another estimator. I'm going to call this the time average estimator. Um, and so this, this, uh, this is the HKM estimator, whose notation I've introduced. Um, and so this, this comes from the estimator that we saw before. Um, so noting that the estimator that we saw before is unbiased for all k, if I select an M, greater than k, and take the average from k to m of these unbiased estimators, I get an, another unbiased estimator, right? So this looks a little bit strange. Let's rewrite this to build some intuition. So um, you can rewrite this as follows. So the first term here, um, you can view as your standard MCMC estimator um, with k as the number of burn-ins and m as the number of MCMC samples. Right? So this is, this is familiar. Okay? This is familiar, and we know that this is, uh, in general, bias. So you can view the second term here, which looks a bit messy, as a bias correction term as before. Okay? And again, this is, um, you should take this as zero if k is uh, at least tau minus one. Okay? So here's a, a plot to kind of visualize what the estimator is doing. Uh, for a particular realization of the meeting time, which I've taken as uh, 10, I've selected k as 5, so this is roughly speaking the number of burn-ins, and m, the number of samples, as 20. So your usual MCMC average uh, 
if you consider the test function h as just the identity, would basically take the x chain uh, starting from 5, and you would average over uh, these values here. Right? So that's the standard stuff. And so now to correct for the bias, what this estimator is roughly doing is, um, so if, if you're looking at, so, so these successive differences here um, would basically correspond to these um, vertical heights here. Right? Um, they are weighted in some sense. And as I should say that you know, I'm trying to basically say what the equation says here because it, we don't really, at this point, have a very good, strong intuition about what these things, these weights really mean. Um, but so basically, roughly speaking, what you're doing is you're taking these uh, vertical differences here, um, you're weighting them in some way, and then you're summing them up until the meeting time. That's what the estimator is doing. Uh, and unfortunately, at this point, we don't really understand why this thing takes this particular form just yet, except that we know that this is an unbiased estimator. OK, so let's now talk about efficiency. So if you fix your compute budget, OK, so you fix your compute time, um, obviously, you can compute more estimators if each estimator takes a short time to compute. right? So it turns out that the appropriate measure of performance um, is given by this paper in, uh, by Glynn and Witt. So this defines the asymptotic inefficiency of our estimator um, here in the limit of your compute budget. Okay? And this has the following form. So roughly speaking, it's the expected cost um, times the variance of our estimator. And here I've decided to write the expected cost uh, in units of the marginal MCMC kernel K. So if you have looked at this kind of debiasing techniques before, um, what will be familiar is that um, bias removal typically comes at the cost of uh, variance inflation. Okay? And so the kind of key message uh, I want to send today is that actually this variance inflation can be controlled if you pick the parameters k and m, okay, which I've introduced as tuning parameters appropriately. Okay? So how do you do that? So the following is kind of a heuristic argument, which works. Um, and you can be a bit more rigorous, and this is given uh, in our NPS paper. So firstly, let me note that if you recall that if, if uh, k is large enough relative to the meeting time, then this uh, bias correction term is just 0. So what that means, um, as before, is that, roughly speaking, our estimator with very high probability would just be the standard MCMC average. Okay? And so we expect its variance to be very similar to that of uh, standard MCMC. So if I select k, um, large enough relative to the meeting time. So in practice, you can, you can simulate the meeting times a bunch of times and look at a large quantile. Okay? So if that were true, then I can, based on this argument on the variance, I can approximate the variance of my estimator as the variance, uh, the asymptotic variance of the underlying MCMC chain, um, sigma of h, divided by the number of samples, which is m minus k plus 1 here, um, and now if I select m, um, so again, so m is by definition at least k. So if k is large relative to tau, you see that in the expected cost here, m is going to dominate, right? So in particular, we can approximate this expected cost as just m. And if we were to assume that m is large relative to k, so uh, the way we would typically do this is to pick m as a very large multiple of k say 10 times, then this ratio would be one, close to 1, and you recover the asymptotic variance of the marginal chain. Okay? So this is why, with appropriate choices of k and m, you can kind of control the, uh, the variance inflation. So let me now describe um, how you actually simulate these chains, and how do you terminate. So to compute our estimator, we're going to start by initializing the Markov chain, x0 and y0, uh, according to a, a coupling, so pi, uh, pi bar 0. So pi bar 0 here is a coupling of just pi, uh, with pi, sorry, it's a coupling of pi times pi. So it, it has pi of its, uh, as marginals. So at marginally, what this means is that x0 is distributed according to pi 0, and y0 is distributed according to pi 0. Um, so to create this one lag difference, what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to first move my X chain. So I'm going to sample X1 um, from the Markov kernel K um, given X0. Um, and now for subsequent times until the max of the meeting time and M, which you choose, we're going to sample these pairs um, from what I'll call a coupled kernel, K bar. Okay? So K bar is a coupled kernel that has K as marginals. So what this means is that marginally, this step here, okay, sampling the pair, is the same as uh, marginally sampling Xt plus 1 um, from, the mar from the marginal kernel K given Xt. And similarly, Yt is marginally sampled from the marginal kernel K given 1t minus 1. Okay? So marginally, what you can check is that um, the random variable Xt has the same distribution as Yt for all times by construction which is kind of what we wanted, right? The second thing we need to construct is a coupled kernel K bar, okay? Such that um, every time you do this, uh, you, you sample from the coupled kernel, there's some chance that these chains are going to meet exactly, okay? And that if they've already mapped, they're going to stay together, okay? So these are, these are the two things. And so now this brings me to sort of my second half of the talk, where we're going to look at how to do these things for MCMC algorithms. Okay? Um, so let me digress slightly by looking at um, couplings. Um, so let's, let's suppose we have a distribution P and a distribution Q defined on RD. Um, a coupling, which I'm going to denote as C, is just a joint distribution okay, with P and Q as marginals. Okay? So from a simulation perspective, this means that if you sample a pair of random variables, X and Y, from C, uh, marginally X is distrib distributed according to P, and Y is distributed according to Q. Obviously, there's infinite, infinitely many couplings between uh, P and Q, um, the simplest of which would be just the independent coupling, where you sample X and Y independently. Uh, I guess some of you guys uh, would be very familiar with the uh, optimal transport coupling, which would try to minimize the expected L2 distance between the random variables. Uh, I won't talk about this today. What I will talk about um, quite a lot today is the maximal coupling. And so this is designed um, to maximize the probability of x being equals to y. So roughly speaking, you're trying to, if you visualize the joint distribution, you're trying to put as much mass as you can along the diagonal. Okay? So here, here are some samples from the independent coupling between uh, a gamma and a Gaussian. Uh, with histograms, so on the top here, you see that uh, marginally, X is distributed according to uh, gamma, and over here, Y, a Gaussian, okay? Here's the same plot for a maximal coupling. And you can see, obviously, that there's some uh, samples that will lie on the diagonal by construction. Um, and over here, we get some samples that look a bit weird. Um, they look a bit weird, bas basically, because you're sampling from the residual mass so that the, the marginal constraints are respected, okay? So if you're wondering how I actually came up with this plot, here's the algorithm to sample from the maximal coupling of a pair of random variables X and Y um, from the maximal coupling of P and Q, okay? So you start by, by sampling X from P, okay, and a, uh, and, um, a uniform U, uh, we then check that u is less than the ratio of q and p. And if that were the case, you output x as the common value. Okay? So this is kind of meeting, if you like. Uh, otherwise, you do the following rejection sampler. Um, so you sample a proposal y star from q now, uh, another, and another uniform. And then if this condition is met, then you output x and the proposed value y star. Okay? Um, and so roughly speaking, the first step here okay, tries to sample from the overlap. Okay? Um, and so in particular, note that, um, so to check that this is a valid coupling, um, let me just note that firstly, so x is sampled according to p, and in both steps, you always output x. Right? So x has the right marginal distribution. So to check that y has the right marginal distribution, what's really happening is that, so in the first step here, you're trying to sample from this overlap 
denoted by this uh, shaded region. And in the second step, what you're really doing is you're constructing a rejection sampler um, that will target, um, say, Q over here, but less the overlap, if you see what I mean. So that's, that's your target for the rejection sampler. Your proposal would just be Q, okay? And then this is basically the acceptance ratio. And so if you do this, then you, you can check that basically Y has the right marginal. So this is indeed a valid coupling, okay? Uh, what's kind of surprising is that actually this coupling is, um, has been around for a very long time. Um, and you can find this, for instance, in this book by Torison. But it's in fact not very well known, uh, surprisingly, um, that you can do this, uh, especially in continuous state spaces. Um, so I thought this is something good to keep in mind. Um, let me make a few remarks about this algorithm. So firstly, this, the first step, okay, as I said before, really samples from the overlap, which is given by the minimum of uh, P and Q. To see that this is in fact actually the maximal coupling, okay, so what you can do is you can write the probability of getting the same value okay, as uh, basically the probability mass of this overlap. right? So that's the area here. Um, you can write this, again, as the 1 minus the TV between these two distributions, um, from which you see that this is indeed the maximal coupling from, uh, because of the coupling inequality, okay? because I have, I have equality here. Um, at first glance, it's not so clear what the expected cost would be and how that depends on P and Q. Um, it's, it's not so hard to check that actually this is uh, in fact such that um, you don't, the cost does not depend on P and Q. Okay? So this is kind of nice from a compute perspective. Right? So you might imagine, you might fear that if the distributions are very far apart you know, or very close by, Things, the cost might be high or large, right? So this is kind of reassuring. Um, so before we try to think about using the maximal coupling um, to couple um, Metropolis Hastings algorithms, um, let me just uh, um, uh, let me just introduce some notation to write down Metropolis Hastings in this slide, right? Let's suppose that we are at time t minus one, and we have a Markov chain that is at position x t minus one. So um, as usual, you would propose X star from a proposal kernel Q, okay? Um, and so this can be, in the random walk Metropolis Hastings case, just a Gaussian centered around where you are. Uh, or, in the ren uh, or in the Mala case, this would be a, given by an euler mariama discretization of uh, the Langevin SDE. So what you, what you then do is you sample a uniform and you accept or reject according to the Metropolis Hastings ratio, right? So that's, that should be uh, hopefully familiar. So now let's think about coupling two chains, okay? So I have chains X, uh, chain X and chain Y at time T minus one, and we want to couple these things. Um, obviously, what, ideally what you might like to do is to sample from the maximal coupling of the Metropolis Hastings kernel associated to these two chains. But that you can't do because these things are not even, uh, they're absolutely, they're not absolutely continuous with respect to each other, right? Because of the delta mass. So what you could do, um, on the other hand, is to sample um, your proposals, X star and Y star, from the maximal coupling of uh, these two proposal transition kernels, right? So that you can do using the algorithm that I showed before. Um, so now once you have that, we can sample a common uniform random variable um, to accept or reject um, the proposal for the X chain and likewise for the Y chain. Okay? So this is, uh, this is kind of what you would expect. Uh, it's important here that you're using a common uniform random variable because if X, is, uh, if X T minus one is the same as Y T minus one, the, the maximal coupling would give you uh, a common proposal, so X star would be equals to Y star. And so here you see that it's important that I use a common uniform because I then want the outcomes of these accept rejects uh, for both chains to be the same, to ensure that my chains would then stay together, right? So it's important that I use a common uniform here, okay? And marginally, it should be obvious that this gives you uh, a coupling of uh, Metropolis Hastings, right? Um, so let's go back to our Gaussian example. Um, here I'm plotting um, both the position in the spatial position and in time 
um, um, the, 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 the exact instance where chains meet. Okay? So the first remark I want to make is that if you just um, look along the x-axis right, and, and, and visualize the distribution of this random variable where the chains meet, okay, this looks nothing like a standard normal, which is what we're targeting. Right? So it should be clear, hopefully, that what we're doing has nothing to do, in some sense, uh, to perfect simulation. So in particular, this does not give you a perfect sample from uh, pi. Okay? Uh, it's not very clear to us how this might relate to um, perfect simulation, so I guess I'll, I'll leave that as a, you know, perhaps an open question for you guys. Um, so that's the first remark I want to make. The second remark, which is sort of more specific to this example, um, is that you can kind of see that chains seem to meet very early on and, um, and a little bit after, when they are close to the origin. Okay? So that's really coming from the fact that um, if you start two chains, and if they, they started very close by, then they just meet there, more or less. Right? And if you started two chains that are quite far apart, they meet when they get close to the stationary distribution, which is kind of close to the origin here. That's kind of what's happening. And so this, this gives rise to a bimodal um, meeting, uh, distribution of the meeting time. OK, so let's now um, investigate how, how good the coupling behaves um, in high dimensions. Okay, so um, here I'm setting things up so that we are sampling from a standard normal distribution. Um, and we are simulating chains that are started at stationarity here um, and propagated according to the coupled random walk Metropolis Hastings um, with this kind of scaling, this kind of diffusion limit scaling to ensure that um, I have algorithms that are in some sense, uh, the acceptance probabilities will be stable as you send dimensions to infinity. Okay? So kind of what you hope to, to see here, which we don't see, is uh, stable meeting times as you increase dimension. All right? So this is kind of a negative message in the sense that you see that these meeting times seem to grow exponentially fast uh, regardless of how you scale, uh, how you choose C. Right? And so in some sense, this plot um, motivated us to look at um, coupling different algorithms, um, in particular um, HMC. Um, so be, even before describing our coupling for HMC, let me kind of um, just uh, quickly flash um, these scaling results uh, that we have for HMC. So in this case, the setup is kind of the same as before, except with that we use our couple HMCs somehow, which I haven't described, and this particular diffusion limit scaling for the step size, right? So that marginally these HMC uh, kernels are sort of stable. Um, and the results are quite good in the sense that you can see that for dimensions that are much, much larger than what I had in the previous slide, um, these meeting times seem to be stable with dimensions. Yes, Eric? In this case? Is it important to start with Ah, yeah, uh, which I'm doing here. Ah, thanks. Oh, you think that it's stable because I'm starting at stationarity? Yeah. So you think that there? Yeah, I agree with you that there might be a transient phase. Uh, yeah, maybe we can discuss later. Um, I don't think I've done the simulation, this exact simulation, starting from somewhere else. OK, so, so let me kind of um, just briefly recap what HMC does um, before we get into the coupling, um, in case people are not so familiar. So um, adhering to the kind of uh, terminology in HMC, let me define the potential energy U as negative log pi, okay? and the Hamiltonian function E as basically the potential energy plus this term, which is the kinetic energy. Right? Now, um, the time evolution of a particle undergoing Hamiltonian dynamics uh, with position Q um, and momentum P um, defined on the joint space, so this is sometimes known as the phase space, okay, is given by this set of uh, ordinary differential equations, um, where, which basically says that the, uh, the position would evolve according to the momentum 
and that the momentum would evolve according to negative gradient of the uh, potential U. Uh, so now I can kind of define an ideal HMC algorithm. Um, so let's assume that we have, um, we are at time t minus one and we have a Markov chain at state x t minus one. Uh, what you can do now is to set the initial condition, uh, so the initial position Q0, as the current state of the Markov chain, and sample an initial momentum from a standard normal. Uh, we then solve uh, Hamiltonian dynamics for, on a time interval of length capital T. So obviously you can't do this uh, in practice for most problems, which is why this is, this is an idealized algorithm. But if you could do that, then if you, if you, if you just return the next state of the Markov chain, as the terminal uh, position, then actually one can check using properties of Hamiltonian dynamics that this is in fact a, a pi invariant Markov kernel. Okay? Um, and as I alluded to earlier, um, typically you cannot solve uh, these uh, Hamiltonian equations exactly in practice, and so we would have to resort to time discretizations. Uh, the simplest, uh, well, a popular choice uh, here is the leapfrog integrator. Uh, basically because this preserves uh, several properties of Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, so this proceeds as follows. So the initial condition is exactly the same as before. Um, and then for capital L, leapfrog steps, um, you update the momentum and the position using these equations. Okay. And then because the leapfrog integrator does not preserve uh, energy, we would have to resort to... Um, a Metropolis Hastings uh, accept reject uh, correction to ensure that we are targeting the right distribution. So if you use properties of the, the leapfrog integrator, you will get um, this acceptance probability of this form. Okay. So that's kind of HMC in a slide. Um, let's now go back to continuous time and think about coupling two particles that are undergoing Hamiltonian dynamics. So I'm denoting these two particles. Uh, I'm indexing them by i equals 1 and 2. Okay? So uh, for a standard Gaussian distribution um, in 1D, what you can do is you can compute um, the, the difference between the, two, the positions of the two particles. Okay? And they take uh, the following form. So in particular, if you stare at this expression, um, and if you were to set the initial uh, momentum to be the same, so that kills this term here and in which case you get this expression here, right? So this says that um, if you pick t for many, many times, you are going to have contraction for this example because of the cosine here, right? Is that clear? And also for some times, uh, for, for different, different times here, T might give you more contraction than others, right? This is kind of what you can see from this very simple example. Uh, let's investigate this coupling which gives the same initial momentum uh, a bit more generally. So if I define delta t as the difference between uh, the positions of these two particles at time t, uh, what you can first do is you can compute the time derivative of the, um, the squared distance. Uh, that takes the following form. And so in particular, if we set, again, the same initial momentum, then this says that um, the squared distance function has a stationary point at time t equals to zero. right? So let's characterize this uh, stationary point by computing the second derivative. And so if you do that, you get this expression here. Um, and now, um, if I assume that these two initial positions, right, so q10 and q20, um, if I assume that they lie in some set I'll denote as S, okay, where the potential function, so recall that this is the negative log uh, target density, is um, strongly convex with a convexity constant alpha. Okay? So in terms of densities, I'm saying that in this part of the space S, the target distribution is strongly log uh, concave. Then you can, uh, you can bound this uh, second derivative as follows. Okay? So from which we can conclude obviously that, obviously that uh, t, is, um, t equals to zero is a strict, stage, uh, strict local maximum from which it follows that um, there exists some capital T, so some, some time interval, uh, where we get contraction, okay, and that this contraction rate would be uh, time, de time dependent. Okay? So here's the plot to, um, to keep in mind. So um, the different colors here represent different initializations. Uh, 
Um, and for each initializa initialization, I have a pair of chains. I'm giving them the same um, initial momentum. We run Hamiltonian dynamics. And here I'm plotting the distance uh, with integration time. Okay? So the main point here is that there exists some time interval um, where these chains get closer. Okay? And so in practice, uh, what you need to do is to try to find these times. Okay? Um, so the argument, actually, that we have in our paper is uh, a little bit different from what I just said. Um, it's not very complicated. It's just uh, basically based on a Taylor expansion of the distance function around uh, t equals to zero. And then you try to control terms uh, under the, uh, the convexity assumption and uh, the assumption that the gradient of u is uh, Lipschitz. Okay? Um, and actually, um, although this result was kind of sufficient for our purpose, at the same time, there was, um, there was a paper by uh, Oren Mangobi and Aaron Smith, um, which actually gave uh, much more quantitative uh, results. Um, this has been since uh, refined slightly by, um, in a recent paper by uh, Nawaf Barobi, um, Andreas Abele, and uh, Raphael Zimmer. And they basically give results of this form, which uh, gives you very explicit characterizations of the time interval where you get contraction. So that's capital T here. And um, explicit expressions of the uh, contraction rate. Um, in particular, what you can see is that these things um, don't seem to depend on dimension, but rather just the, um, what's I guess sometimes known as the uh, condition number, which is given by the ratio of the convexity constant alpha and the Lipschitz uh, constant beta. Okay? So this suggests that uh, in particular that this coupling might be quite effective in high dimensions if the problem is well conditioned. Yeah, I mean, the, under these assumptions. Yeah. And here, you're only looking at the continuous time dynamics. Right, so now I can describe my, um, my couple HMC kernel, um, which is kind of what you would expect. So again, I have two chains, X and Y, at time T minus 1. Um, I set my initial condition. Um, so for the states here, I give them the same initial momentum. I do leapfrog integration for these two particles. Um, I sample a common uniform random variable, u star, and then I accept and reject using uh, that uniform okay, for both chains. Uh, here's um, a plot to kind of illustrate the, what happens. So this, is, um, so this is for a problem where these uh, chains are in a part of the space where things are, um, where the potential is um, convex. And so you expect contraction here if you give them the same initial momentum. So I have a particle 1 starting over here, particle 2 over here. You give them the same initial momentum. Because these guys are um, in this part of the space where things are convex, the gradients are going to align. And so when you do leapfrog integration, you're going to go here. That chain will go here. And you see that they get a little bit closer um, because I've selected this time to, be, uh, to get contraction. And then if the step size is kind of small enough, then these uh, proposals will be accepted. And then you repeat the same thing to, to go to the next step and, and, and so forth. Right? So you can see that if I iterate this, uh, after a few iterations, my chains will get closer and closer. Um, here's, um, here's the distance um, after, of these couple chains after 1,000 iterations um, for um, different number of leapfrog steps and different step sizes, which would induce uh, different integration times here. And you can see that there's going to be a large, uh, well, in this case, I guess there's many combinations uh, of, parameter, of parameters I can pick to get contraction. Okay? And so this is kind of a plot that I actually do uh, um, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm given a problem. I would just, you know, you can, you can produce a plot like this uh, with uh, many, many parallel processes. Um, you can get this plot pretty quickly, and then you can kind of decide, okay, um, what configurations you want to use to get to get contraction. Um, and if, if you wanted to be a bit more clever, you might also kind of have a think about how uh, the cost plays into this, in particular, uh, the number of leapfrog steps that you use, uh, and so forth. So this is kind of, a, I, get, I guess, a nice plot to produce. Um, no, in particular, at this point, that 
the couple HMC kernel only gets the chain to be close, um, but they don't actually get the chain to meet exactly. Okay? And so to, to encourage meetings, what we actually do is we, uh, we consider the following mixture kernel, which combines the couple HMC kernel, which drives you close, um, and the couple random walk kernel, okay, which triggers meetings when chains are close. So to do that, what you have to do is to um, select the proposal, cover, um, the proposal standard deviation sigma of the coupled random walk metropolis Hastings uh, in an appropriate way. So in particular, um, what we need is for sigma to be um, quite a bit bigger than the distance between the two chains. Okay? So this will eventually happen uh, thanks to the contractive properties of uh, coupled um, HMC. And so once that happens, the, the maximal coupling within coupled random walk metropolis Hastings would propose, uh, would be likely to propose a common value. Okay? So once you have a common value uh, as a proposal, you would also like to accept these proposals within the random walk metropolis Hastings itself. And so therefore, you need sigma to be um, quite a bit smaller than the spread of pi to accept this with high probability. Right? So if these two things happen, then you get, um, you get them to meet. Um, and based on consi uh, efficiency considerations, we also advocate that um, gamma, which is the probability that you select the coupled random walk metropolis Hastings, should be small. Okay? Otherwise, you'll be doing very inefficient uh, small random walk metropolis Hastings move um, very frequently. Um, so let's just uh, quickly recall. So to get validity of our estimators, we needed three things. Um, in particular, we needed convergence of the marginal chain. Uh, the meeting time to have geometric tails and the coupling to be faithful. Okay, so the first uh, number one is simple because this is a mixture, and so if the uh, the marginal HMC, HMC chain is uh, converging, then the the marginal chain of this mixture would converge, right? So that's uh, that's simple. Um, faithfulness is also simple because by construction, uh, both of these coupled kernels would be faithful. Um, where we kind of needed to do most of the work is really to establish that the meeting time has geometric tails. Um, and so let me just kind of um, list the kind of assumptions that we made to, um, to get this. Um, so the, the first two I've kind of said before, so the gradient of U is uh, globally Lipschitz. Uh, U is uh, strongly convex, but only on some part of the space. Um, that is in some sense visited frequently enough by the, the HMC kernel. So we have a kind of uh, drift condition to get the, uh, the chains to, um, to control excursions outside of uh, the set S. Okay? So S is a set where the chains can contract and meet. And so you kind of need to control these excursions to, get, uh, to say that the meeting time has geometric tails. Okay? And this only holds uh, in our results if you pick these parameters kind of small enough. Um, and these assumptions are kind of realistic in the sense that you can verify them um, for some problems. Uh, but in particular, we relied uh, a lot on the results uh, in this recent paper by um, uh, Elaine Dermis, uh, Eric Moulin, and actually uh, and e Eero Sutzman. Um, so these are just some plots to say that um, the meeting time is not so uh, sensitive um, to the choice of uh, sigma, which controls the proposal standard deviation, as long as you pick sigma small enough. So in particular, I'm varying sigma by several orders of magnitude here, and, and the meeting time seems to be quite stable. Uh, and it's kind of the same message here for the parameter gamma, which controls the probability that you pick a uh, coupled random walk metropolis Hastings. Um, so let me just say one thing about this slide. So this slide was to just send the main message uh, that our proposed methodology actually does not work if the marginal chain does not mix. Okay? This can be made precise using kind of uh, bounds like that. Okay? Um, let me end with this slide. Um, so earlier in the start of the talk, I was saying that um, you can pick these parameters, k and m, um, to control the variance uh, inflation when you, when you debias these things. Um, in particular, I'm kind of illustrating this for uh, a logistic regression. Um, and you can kind of see that, okay, so basically uh, the role to look at here is uh, the case where, the quant where k is large relative to the meeting time 
m is large relative to k, and we get a relative inefficiency uh, close to 1. That's defined basically as the asymptotic inefficiency that we saw before, uh, divided by basically the variance, uh, the asymptotic variance of an optimal HMC kernel, where I'm optimizing over um, both the step size and the, the number of leapfrog steps. Okay? Uh, one last thing that I would like to point out um, is that in this case, for some reason, um, the, this thing is kind of close to 1, which is not what you typically expect, because um, if, even if you set k and m in the right way, uh, the numerator, based on the arguments I showed earlier in my talk, will converge to the asymptotic variance of the marginal HMC chain. So that might, might or might not be close to that of the optimal HMC chain. So you do expect some loss of inefficiency here because we, are, we can only pick parameters that give us contraction. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. Um, I guess I'll wrap it up here. So the paper is uh, on archive. If you're interested in having a read, we have an R package. Um, if you are interested to have a play with this, and here are some of other uh, unbiased MCMC papers. Thanks. Ah, okay. Uh, we're not aware of this connection, actually. That's, uh, no, because it can't be a million miles away. So I just wondered whether there were some, there were some insights from that literature, which is quite large. No, we, are, yeah, we actually That's don't know. It's a good kind of game, because you, know, you are dealing with a dependent series, essentially. Right, that yeah, that's very good to know, yeah. Great, yeah, thanks. <laughs>